Okay, so what do uh, real microwave rotational spectra look like? So we said if we want to work in wave numbers, right, that they're pretty easy to spot. You see a series of lines that are equidistant and uh, with a spacing of 2b, let's say, and uh, all of them are exactly the same. Obviously, no line at zero. That would be kind of hard to imagine. So uh, what do they really look like? So uh, they don't look like this. So uh, first of all, we know that the lines themselves are broadened, right? We know that lines themselves are not infinitely narrow. They have some kind of uh, width to them. Well, we looked at the width at half height is uh, some kind of measure of the spread. We saw that there's a couple of contributions to the, uh, the width at half height. One contribution is the Doppler effect, the idea that the molecules are not all moving in the same direction. And so uh, ones that are moving towards the radiation see a higher frequency than the ones that are moving away, so they see a lower frequency. And um, for gases, this is something that um, typically applies more than they would maybe for solids or liquids. We also see lifetime broadening. And so the idea is that the states that do not live for a long time tend to have a large uncertainty in energy, which gives rise to a sort of a large width in the uh, spectrum. So uh, the lifetime broadening is the second thing. Uh, to be honest, though, for these rotational spectra, they're actually fairly narrow. So uh, those really aren't the uh, two important effects that I want to talk about. Instead, let's have another look at the energy level diagram. So we've got uh, an energy axis right here, and we know that we have different energy levels corresponding to j equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And we see uh, transitions um, between the levels, so 0, 1, 2, 3. And, uh, oh gosh, I guess these levels themselves have energy, right? So this is 0, and this is 2b, and this is 6b, and this is 12b. The selection rule is that you can only go up or down one level at a time, so you can go from 0 to 1, or you can go from 1 to 2, or you can go from 2 to 3, or you can go from 3 to 4. And those energy differences, of course, are pretty easy to figure out here. So this corresponds to a change in energy of 2b. And uh, the next transition is a change in energy of 4b. And the next one is a change in energy of 6b. So again, that's why you get those lines in the spectrum that are 2b apart. So uh, if we go ahead and we plot the uh, um, frequency, let's say, and uh, we look at these guys. So uh, these guys are at 2b over h, so that converts it into frequency, and 4b, the energy divided by Planck's constant, and 6b, and so on. So we see these lines here corresponding to these transitions, right? And I think we looked at this earlier, so this is 0, 1, this is 1, 2, this is 2, 3. Now remember, Beer's Law, right? So Beer's Law has absolutely nothing to do with uh, Corona, Beer. And uh, Beer's Law, or the Beer-Lambert Law, basically says that the absorption is proportional to the concentration. We went through the derivation in class. It was a very nice derivation. Now you might say, well, what about the concentration, right? If we just have a gas, right? That presumably it has a fixed concentration. But hold on one second, right? So we're not on about the concentration of the molecules themselves. We're on about, if you like, the concentration of the molecules in these states. So we might expect um, that there will be an awful lot of molecules in the grand rotational state. And as we get to higher and higher levels, right, there will be fewer and fewer molecules in them. So if we're doing a transition maybe from 0 to 1, then we've got a lot of molecules in the zero state, so to bring them up to the first state, that's a fairly decent absorption. Now, if we're going to transition from one to two, you can see there's not nearly as many molecules in the first state here, so the absorption is going to be much lower. And uh, as you start to go up and up, this becomes more important. So if you're going from the second level to the third level, Right, you've only got two molecules maybe in my diagram here that are in the second level, so uh, the absorption is going to be much lower thanks to Beer's law compared to say the zero to one. So that's uh, roughly what we're uh, going to talk about now in the next few minutes. So we have an equation called the Boltzmann equation, and uh, it tells us that if we've got a couple of levels, um, so here's an energy diagram, and here is a lower level, and here is an upper level. And, uh, of course, we are probably going to expect there to be more molecules in the lower level than the upper level. So if we draw little circles here to represent a molecule 
um, in the lower state and circles here in the upper state, we probably expect to see more in one than the upper. So the uh, Boltzmann equation we've seen a few times in class is the number in the upper compared to the number in the lower is given by e to the minus that difference in energy between the two levels. So this is delta e right here divided by kt. Um, or uh, sometimes you can do it as uh, e to the minus delta e over rt. So what's the difference between these two forms? Um, if you measure delta e per molecule, okay, you're going to use this equation right here. So this is the Boltzmann constant, which remember is the gas constant per molecule. So that's the gas constant divided by the uh, number of things in a mole. Now if you do it uh, per mole, Okay, so uh, if you've got the difference per one molecule and you multiply by Avogadro's number, then of course you don't have to divide by K anymore, you divide by R. So uh, whichever way you prefer, uh, we'll probably um, use the top approach a lot because all our equations are per molecule. But uh, if you had that as, say, you know, so many kilojoules per mole, then you would use the bottom equation. So what do we have for our uh, rotations here? So we got a couple of energy levels. So uh, we've got... Um, say uh, J equals zero, so that's our grain state, that's what we're going to compare everything to. So we're going to go ahead and say compare to the lowest level, what does it all look like? And here's an excited state up here, so this is going to be uh, J. And uh, we know that the energy of the grain state is uh, just uh, B times by J times by J plus one. So uh, if J is zero, right, all this stuff is zero here, so we can say there's no zero point energy. But if you are in level J, then your energy is equal to B, J, J plus 1, and now J is not equal to 1. So if we want to find that difference in energy, that difference in energy compared to the grain state, right, is just the energy of the upper state. So that is B, J, J plus 1. So we take our Boltzmann equation, we say how many are in the upper compared to the number in the lower. So, you know, our upper is up here and our lower is down here, so we're trying to calculate that ratio. And uh, that is, uh, presumably, it turns out it's not, so spoiler alert, it is e to the minus that change in energy, so b, j, j plus 1. Okay, and that's a per molecule basis, so we divide by kt. And it turns out we have forgotten something. So the thing that we have forgotten that makes this equation actually wrong at this point is we forgot, do you know? Uh, that's right, we forgot the degeneracy. So uh, we're looking at the levels, but each level has multiple states. And uh, for the rotations, the number of l states in each level is 2j plus 1. So we need to take that into account. So if we go back and sketch that energy diagram in a little more detail, okay, so this is j equals 0. This is the lowest one. And as we go on up to uh, j equals 1, there are one, two, three states there in that level. And if we go to J equals two, right, there are one, two, three, four, five. So our equation we derived earlier was G sub J is equal to two J plus one. And uh, if you're trying to remember, well, what is this on about? Remember, we've got another quantum number, the magnetic quantum number. And the magnetic quantum number takes values from minus J uh, all the way to uh, positive j. And so when you count those out, right, there's actually two j plus one contributions there. Now the magnetic quantum number in the absence of a magnetic field doesn't affect the energy, but we can see, uh, kind of like we saw with uh, hydrogen atoms, right, there's one s orbital, there's three p's, and there's five d's in a subshell. There are one, three, and five states here for these rotational levels. So we got to take that into account. So now we can go ahead and we can write our real um, Boltzmann equation that, and uh, for real, so the number in the upper level, we'll call it J, over the number in the lower level, okay, we're going to call that J equals zero, is equal to, um, well, it's still that ratio, so E to the minus that change in energy, so E to the minus B, J, J plus one, all divided by KT, but uh, now in the upper levels, we have um, uh, two J plus one terms here, so we need to take that into account. So we put the degeneracy 2j plus 1 up front. So the Boltzmann equation by itself would give us the ratio of each particular state in the level to the grain state. But the degeneracy says, well, yeah, each state might have that ratio of whatever it may be, but there are 
two j plus one states in each level so we need to add them all up right so uh, we just multiply by that contribution if there's five of them here right we add it up five times which is multiplication by five so this is our full uh, and real equation that we're going to use here what's a little surprising about this is that we've got two terms that are kind of competing with each other so uh, we've got our initial term which tells us about the degeneracies and uh, as we go to larger and larger j our degeneracies increase so it's just a straight line right so as we uh, double j and add one to it as j gets bigger and bigger this term gets bigger and bigger if we look at the second term though right that's our exponential term here and we know what exponential decay looks like so uh, if we look at uh, e to the minus delta e over kt um, versus our value of j as j gets bigger and bigger um, this energy is larger and larger e to the negative a larger number is a smaller number so we have got an exponential decay here and uh, the crazy thing is that we are multiplying together a term that keeps going up with j um, the degeneracies by a term that keeps going down with j so we actually have a fight on our hands here so as I pull up a new slide here, right, we've got our two terms here. Our degeneracy is saying there's more and more states in each level. The higher you go, the more places you are able of storing the energy. And the uh, e to the minus term here says that the higher up you go, the less chance you'll actually be able to reach that place. So uh, although there are more places, as you go to higher and higher energies, it gets harder and harder to store it in there. So if we multiply it together, right, we see the effect from the degeneracy and the Boltzmann uh, energy equation. And what's kind of neat is that, in actual fact, if you measure this ratio, the number in J um, compared to the number in J equals zero, um, obviously that must be unity here for when J equals zero. Uh, but as we go to a higher and higher values, what we see initially is that this actually goes up because as we go up a little bit in J, there's more places to store that energy. Uh, but as we go up even higher and higher, it turns out even though there's more places to store them, uh, there's a lower and lower probability of being up there. So you end up with a curve that looks something like this. So uh, the spectrum itself, uh, we know that J itself, right, is a quantum number. And most of these quantum numbers, right, they can't be variable, right? They can take values, so like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, this is essentially, right, our concentration curve. So remember Beer's law, right? Absorption is proportional to concentration. So now if we look at that spectrum, right, we're going to say that the height of the peak, right, uh, which corresponds to the absorption, is proportional to the concentration, proportional to the number in that state. So now if we go to j equals 0, right, we'll see a peak uh, that looks something like that. And if we go to j equals 1, we'll see a peak that's bigger because uh, more molecules are starting out in the j equals 1 state. And if we go to 2, it peaks, and 3, it's just starting to turn over. And as we go to 4 and 5 and 6, and um, I'm not sure it actually goes all the way to 0, unless j goes to infinity, but you'll see smaller and smaller peaks out to the side. And so when you look at the spectrum, if I just go ahead and jot it out to the side, and uh, we go in, oh, wave number units, why not? And here is 0. And, of course, we're expecting to see, you know, our 2b and our 4b and our 6b and I uh, can't spell B, that's terrible, and then our 8B, and uh, our line's going to look something like this, so it looks pretty good. Uh, oh, wait, we don't see a line there, do we? We can't have a, uh, a uh, zero energy transition there. So our first line then uh, looks something like this, and this is our zero, one transition, and then our second line is the uh, one, two transition, and our third line is actually where it peaks, right? So that is our three um, well, I can't, can't, that's our 2, 3 transition. And then as we go to the other ones, right, so they're starting at 3 and going to 4 and 4 to 5 and 5 to 6, we've got lower and lower probabilities of seeing those lines. So they're going to be smaller and smaller, and we have our spectrum, right, that has that comb shape, I suppose. So each one gets uh, a little bit smaller as we go out. So it's like there's a curve um, that we can kind of draw a dotted line over top that tells us that, Boltzmann contribution um, times by our degeneracy contribution. So our real spectra looks um, a little more interesting than uh, our stick figure spectrum. And uh, there's some interesting applications, actually. So uh, this will be the end of the chapter. 
uh, well, the end of this section here, that'll be on the next exam. And so uh, what we find is that the envelope um, that we see um, will change with temperature. And so uh, at low temperature, uh, we might see an envelope that looks something like this, right? It peaks here, so this is what the 0, 1, uh, the 1, 2, the 2, 3, and at, you know, low temperature, right? Um, oh gosh, that's not right, is it? That should be uh, 3, 4. This is very hard to count and talk, so 3, 4 and 4, 5, and 5, 6, and so on. So at low temperature, right, there's really not a lot of um, um, molecules up in those uh, states there. But as you go to higher and higher temperatures, uh, you have a lot more thermal energy now, so you can reach those higher states. So that envelope shifts, okay, to the right. And, uh, okay, so now our peaks might look something like so. And uh, you can actually estimate from the maximum, okay, so we can see at low temperature, the maximum there is 2, 3, but at the higher temperatures here, this is what, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, this is 5, 6. Um, you can go ahead and actually have a very rough estimate of how hot your gas is. In essence, you just need to differentiate this envelope function, and you can find the maxima. Of course, the maxima has to occur at a whole number transition, right? You can't have intermediate quantum numbers. You can't have 5.2, let's say. It's got to be 5 or 6 or 7. But it gives you a rough way to figure out the temperature of the gas. There's a derivation in our book. I believe that this approach was used to actually figure out the temperature on Venus. I'm not sure if this is Venus or not, but it certainly looks like it could be Venus to my eyes. And you can go ahead and you can look at the emission spectrum. So the light's given out instead of absorbed. So it's the same general idea. You can look at this rotational transitions of molecules in the atmosphere of Venus. A lot of sulfuric acid, I believe. And you can look where the peak in the spectrum is. And the peak in the spectrum will go ahead and give you an estimate of the temperature. So that's a pretty cool effect.